Hi, my name is Paul Grogan, and in this Gaming Rules video, I'm going to be giving you my quick and dirty review of Merlin. No, not that one, and definitely not that one. This is the one, a board game designed by Stefan Feld and Michael Reinick, and published by Queen Games in 2017. Now, Stefan Feld is one of my favourite designers, and Michael Reinick designed Pillars of the Earth, which is one of my favourite games of all time. So I was extremely excited about this game, and... It was a while after getting it, we, I got it at Essen 2017, it was quite a while after Essen that I actually got round to playing it. And I'll have to admit, I was a little nervous about it, because I'd spoken to lots of people after Essen who played the game, and most people had said, eh, it's just a bit meh. Only a couple of people said they really didn't like it, only a couple of people said they really like it, and everybody else was like, eh, it's okay, but it's nothing special. So, I went into my first game of it, pretty much with low expectations, which is always a, a, a good thing to do, rather than going in with high expectations. And uh, if you want to know what I think of it, then I do actually really like the game. I am going to cover bits I liked and bits I didn't like in this video, but overall, I do really like the game. So, what is it? Well, it's a roll and move game, and I don't mean that in any kind of derogatory way. I mean it as an explanation for the core mechanics of the game. You roll your dice, and then you move your piece that many spaces clockwise around the board. Which sounds terrible, but actually it's not. What Stefan and Michael have done is they have introduced roll and move and they've made it good. And they've made it so that you actually have lots of decisions about how it works. Now, I don't normally cover rules in these videos. I like to just go into the details of the bit I like, but I kind of need to cover the rules of, of how this bit works um, in order to explain why I like it so much. Okay, so let's say I've rolled a two, three, and a five, and this is this is where I'm starting. You can only go clockwise around the round table. Um, so basically, I'm going to be moving at some point ten. Okay, so I'm going to end up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right, so that's where I'm going to end up. So I can sort of plan ahead of time the action that I'm going to do when I arrive here. But how I arrive here is up to me. I could go two, and then three, and then five or I could go three and then two and then five, or I could go five and... So actually, although I'm ending up here, the route that I take to get there is, is different. And that's why you do have quite a lot of choice with your dice. The other bit I really like about the game is that once during each round, you're gonna move Merlin. So you'll roll your own dice as well as the Merlin dice. And then everybody moves Merlin, um, but basically, so if I've rolled a four for Merlin, I can move him four spaces that way or that way. Because Merlin's so good, he can move anti-clockwise as well. Sorry, I've just killed you. Now, when you choose to move Merlin, so let's say I've rolled a four for Merlin, and I really want to move, do this space here. I would need to get in before anybody else moved him, and I use my four to move him to here. However, if I didn't want either of these two spaces, I would probably want to wait with this die, and let's say somebody else rolled a one for Merlin, and they moved him here, I go, ah, right. This is the space I really want, so I'll now use my four and I'll go on there. So you get three of your own dice uh, to move your own knight each round, and you also get one Merlin, which moves the Merlin piece. But that's not everything, because there are these flags. There's the flags that you can pick up during the game. This blue flag, for example, this is pretty awesome. So um, before you decide to take your action and move, you can use this flag, and for that one move, you actually go anti-clockwise around the board. So all of a sudden, your choices just, you know, exponentially increase. Instead of going there, there, and there, well, you could go backwards for the first move and then forwards, or you could go forwards for the first move and backwards. So many choices with that flag, um, which is the other one. So the, the brown flag, after you've moved, you use this flag to basically move your piece to the opposite side of the board. And again, and, and then you stay on the opposite side of the board and you move from there. So your choices open up quite a lot. Now, because of that, there is quite a lot of planning that you can do during the game. You, while it's the other player's turns, you're looking at your board and you're thinking, right, well, next I could move the three, and then I could move... You're doing all of that while it's the other player's turns, which is great. So when it comes around to your turn, generally, you, you take your turn fairly quickly. The game is prone to problems with analysis paralysis. Um, now, even though you can plan ahead, and if you haven't got any of the flags, then it's relatively simple. But if you start throwing in the flags, the choices that you have, they do become a lot. So with, with people who are prone to analysis paralysis, or AP, um, they might find the game uh, have too many choices for them, and it may be a little slow. This environ board is a really cool mechanic. I just love the way that this bit works. Basically, one of the things that you can do in, these in this game is you can, you can build these estates 
onto this board. And if you build on one of these spaces, you get the bonus that's printed. Um, if you build on these spaces, you don't get an immediate bonus. And then when there, whenever there is a scoring round, this is kind of area control. So this area, these were randomly laid out at the start of the game. So this area here is four green uh, foresty spaces. So in the scoring round, the red player will earn four points. If somebody else was there in there as well, then they would share the points. But the way that you build the estates in this area is by using the cubes. So if I have a blue cube, for example, here's the blue cube, I can build anywhere in that line or anywhere in that line. And I, as I say, I really like how this bit works. So one of the main things about the game is tactics versus strategy. You can have a strategy going into this game. You can say, right, in this game, I'm going to build lots of estates in the environs. You could say that, or I'm going to try to get Excalibur and get rid of my trait. But you kind of want to be doing, you want to be doing all of these things all of the time because it's your usual point salad style game. Lots and lots of things you can do gets you points. And there are parts of the game that you don't need to do if you just focus on other parts. But it's very tactical in that you've got to take each turn, each, each of the rounds as it comes. You roll your dice and you're like, right, what do these dice, what options do I have and what can I best do with the dice that I've got? Uh, so in the, in the most recent game I played, I managed to collect loads of shields, for example. And then I went on the space that gave me points for having shields. But then I needed to spend my shields in order to get rid of the traitors. But then I needed a new plan and then I started collecting cubes. So then I started moving into estates. So it's a game where you need to basically um, react to what the dice give you. As I say, there are some ways that you can, um, you know, you, you have lots of choices and you can manipulate the results. So you start the game with an apple, for example. Where's the apples? I don't have them. But there's apples and you can use an apple and it basically turns any of your dice to whatever you want. And if you've got an apple, again, that suddenly opens up. So you have a lot of choice over what you can do but it is also reacting to what the dice have, have rolled for you, what options are available for you, and being flexible with any strategy that you had in order to be able to adapt and do different things based on the situation. Now, there is luck in the game. For a start, you're rolling dice to move, but as I've mentioned before, there's lots of ways that you can use that. There are these mission cards. So you start the game with four mission cards in your hand, and these basically tell you something that you're trying to do, and you can achieve one of these missions every single time it's your turn, and then you get a replacement one. So you want to be trying to achieve as many of these missions as you, they, as you can. And all of them have things that you need on them, but you don't spend them. So this one is basically having four influence markers. As soon as you've got four influence markers on the board, bang, three points, draw a new mission. So you want to be completing as many of these as you can. And the fact that you've got four of them, and there are ways in the game that you can recycle them out, I feel that this is, it is a look factor of the game. Of course, there are missions that you can get which suit what you're doing. But because you've got four and there's always three on display and whenever you pick one up, you pick up from the ones on display, you generally, you're not stuck with, well, you can be, I guess. You could be stuck with four missions that you can't do. But then as I say, you've got to be flexible and you've got to think, right, well, if I can't do them now, I'll aim towards doing them. And you want to try to do as many of those missions as you can. So there's the look in the dice, there's the look in the missions. The way the traitors work is, obviously, every time the, the game's divided into three parts, and at the start of each part, you will draw three traitors, and that will be the ones that you have to fight off that turn, which means you have to collect shields in order to fight off that particular traitor. And if you don't, you'll lose points. So it could be, and this did happen to Andy, one of my friends who played it, is that he had quite a lot of shields, and then the next time he drew three traitors, he got traitors that didn't match his shields. So there was a bit of a look factor there. But overall, I don't feel that there is a massive look factor in the game, personally. I feel that uh, skill and tactics will generally win out, the better player will generally do better, um, because all of the little bits of look kind of, I, 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 you know, they are look based, but none of them have, in my opinion, a major impact on the game. Now, quality of components is always something that I like to mention in game. The quality of components is really good. All the wooden components are great. The cardboard is really thick and chunky. The artwork and presentation, I think is fantastic. I really, really like it. So absolutely no problem with the components whatsoever. They're all just really, really good. The rule book, it's a long time since I have read a rule book from start to finish and we were able to play the game with zero questions. The rule book for this game is really, really good. Everything was clear, everything was laid out, it made the game easy to learn. I've had no questions in three plays uh, and everything was there. So rule book, absolutely fantastic job, well done to the people involved in doing that.
So overall, I think the graphic design is actually really good, but there are a few points which really, really bugged me. So if we look at each principality, for example, if you put a henchman on here, the little henchman, you can't probably see it here, there's a little icon of a cube, which is great, because if you put it there, you get one of these cubes. And that's good because the tent is near this. This one, however, is the guy with the sword and shield. And when you go on this one, you take the shield, which is over here. Whereas this one is the woman that's holding the influence marker. The influence marker goes here. And the guy with the banner, that goes here. Basically, if these two were swapped around, it just would be a lot clearer that that one gets that one, that one gets that one, that one gets that one, and that one gets that one. It's a minor thing, but it, what frustrates me is that it could have so easily been fixed and it, it would have made a bit of a difference during the game. It would have made it a little bit more intuitive. The bigger problem, graphic design-wise, are these two spaces here, because they both look very, very similar, but they work differently, and this is the problem. This is, choose one area in which you have influence and get one cube from that area, okay? Whereas this one is, for every influence you have, you get one point. And, I don't know, maybe there should have been a one times on here, or a different coloured arrow or something, but the iconography is so similar, but they work in different ways. So that, that was something else which, which bugged me a little bit. But the biggest issue by far are these shields. Now these shields on their own look really good, and they're, they're quite clear. You know, there's a colour and there's an icon. So this is the black dragon, this is the grey bird, etc, etc. However, on your player board, what they've got is they've got uh, you know, shields with a bright light source next to them. So all of the colours are very, very faded. And you think, well, that's okay for that one, because it's clearly that that one goes on that one. But when you look at these two, it's, com it's confusing. And so many times when I'm playing this game, somebody picks up this grey shield and puts it here, because this looks like a grey shield. So on, on this, the grey looks white and the black looks grey. And over here, these two look a little bit similar, the brown and the orange. So again, you'll find people accidentally putting this one there or there and you really need I mean the eye that you know the graphics here are quite clear but I just don't know why they've put these bright versions of the shields on the player boards they should have put them just the same color as these shields really although then you might not be able to easily see whether you've got one or not but I, either way it doesn't quite work and it does cause problems during the game so overall this is a game which I really really like a lot of people forget that it is Michael Reinach who designed it, as well as Stefan Feld. So people are kind of ranking it amongst their favourite Stefan Feld games, even though it's a co-design. It's certainly not my favourite Stefan Feld game. It's by far not my least favourite. Um, I would have to rate all of my Stefan Feld games in order to see where it fits. But I do really enjoy playing the game. It's got a nice length for the amount of complexity uh, of the game, and I would definitely like to play it again. So this is definitely staying in my collection. I hope you found this video useful, and if you want to see any more of my videos, please subscribe to my channel and consider supporting my Patreon, which make these reviews possible. Until next time, take care, and thanks for watching.